Okay, let's start discussing the fundamental concepts. The first uh, thing we have to underline in discussing the quantum theory, that is the physics in the micro world. When I say quantum theory, physics in the micro world is the concept of states. Well, concept of states is central to physics. Why? Because if you define as a concept state, then in principle you should be able to answer all the questions about the system that you can ask. Well, let's start with the classical physics. How do we define the state? Well, in classical physics. Why do I ask that question? Because if you would like to, if you are going to talk about this concept of state in the quantum theory, you have to decide whether it's a new concept all of a sudden you had to, you had to generate. Or was there a, a concept like that in the classical physics which you had to modify? Although it's not emphasized in uh, most of the books, this re is really the case. A concept of state exists in the classical physics but needs to be modified. What do I mean? Well, the, the, what are the, the basic ingredients of the classical physics, whether it's Newton's or Hamilton's or Lagrangian formulation or Poisson's, doesn't matter. In essence, you have an equation of this form, right? And even a primary school student know that f equals ma. Well, what is the a? It is the rate of change of the velocity. So it is m dv dt. And as mass is a constant in the context of classical Newtonian physics, you can write it as such. That these are all equivalent forms, right? So if you have an external agent which is exerting a system and a force on a system, then its, its momentum changes accordingly, dB dt. Okay. Why do I call this the equation of motion? Because if I have this equation of motion, I can predict the future. I'm using a loose language on purpose. So what do I mean I can predict the future? For example, I can predict where the object will be in the future. Can I? Well, let's see. And more than that, I can also predict where, what is the state of motion of that system is. The position and state of motion is the momentum or the velocity, right? So it can predict, this is a crucial word, x, t, and p, t. I put the question mark, you say, why? How do I predict? Well, actually, this is a second order differential equation, right? If you go through that, what is it? Another equivalent way of writing it is this. Second degree differential equation in time for each component or each degree of freedom. This is a simple single particle represented by a Cartesian coordinate, has three components. But it, it can be a system, therefore you may have as many degrees of freedom as possible. For each degree of freedom, there is an equation like that. Second degree differential equation. So you need two initial conditions for each degree of freedom. Need two initial conditions. for each i. I represent the, here the, the, the degrees of freedom by i. If it is a single particle, i is 1, 2, 3 Cartesian, or it could be generalized coordinates, then i is again all, running through all the degrees of freedom. Need two initial conditions. What are those initial conditions? What are they? 
xi is 0, pi is 0. If I know these initial conditions for each degree of freedom, I can predict their future values as time elapses at any future time. I can predict this and this uniquely, precisely. When I say uniquely, precisely, I'm talking about two concepts. Causality is one, and there's another one. Let me leave it, for, postpone it to a few minutes later. So if I know these, I can predict those. Does it really offer me a, a concept, philosophical concept of a state? Yes. It tells you that if I know this set for all degrees of freedom, and that describes properly and completely the state of the system, the state of the system. I can answer any question about the system if I know the set. How do I know? I can predict their future values at any time I like. I can say that after so many hours it will be in that particular position of the moon when I send this system from here, the rocket, right? I can place it on the orbit of that particular orbit around the moon or around the Mars or around wherever. So that tells me that this set of numbers defines the state of the classical physics, this entire set. for I running for the degrees of freedom. If it is a single free particle, single particle, x1, x2, x3, p1, p2, p3. Six numbers describes the physical system completely. And I said system is causal because this equation, this equation, this equation, all well, these are equivalent equations, but I refer to this differential equation form, second degree time in time. So that enabled me to come up with this concept of state. The causal, because if I know the initial conditions, I can uniquely predict, uniquely and precisely predict these. That's the meaning of causality. Nice. This is also deterministic classical physics. I can answer any question. If I have that information in hand, I can answer any question about the system. I can tell you what will be the energy at a future time, what will be the angle of momentum, how it, so and so. Any question you can ask about the system is answered with that information. That's a full, complete, precise information. That's why I call it state. So even in classical physics, there's the concept of state, well-defined. We'll see how that will change and why it should change. Well, everything is based on the essential observation that physics is a phenomenological science. What do I mean? There is only one way to gather information, to measure observation and experimentation and measure. The only way to get that gather information is me measurement. Uh -huh. So the key concept is measurement. That is oh, experiment and observation. Well, observation, experiment is an observation, that's a direct, in what the, you, you, you can interfere and intervene. Observation is, if you cannot directly intervene or interfere, you watch the heavens far away. And the signal coming from 13.7 billion years away from the boundary of the universe, right? That's an observation, there is no way of directly recreating that regime and then direct, making direct experimentation. 
you say, aha, uh -huh, there is one exception. At CERN, at LHC, they reach the 10 tera electron volt energy, which is very much like the first few seconds after the Big Bang. So you have a direct way of carrying out experimentation. So the astrophysical observation is an observation because you cannot intervene, but at the 10 tera electron volt energy of the LHC, then you are mimicking that regime, so you are doing carrying out actual experiment. So these two. But anyway, this is a, a philosophically new concept. There is only one way of gathering new information, that's measurement. Then there must be, if there is a need of changing that concept of the state from classical to this new regime, obviously it, there's a need for changing. I'm not doing classical physics, so I didn't go through the needs, those uh, new developments which triggered the quantum theory, the also called uh, the instability of the atom based on Keplerian model, etc., etc. You have seen those uh, previously. But there's a need to change the concept because this law with that definition of the state doesn't work properly to explain the stability of the atoms, let alone anything else. Why is that so? It must be based on in here, measurement. Well, we carry out measurement in classical physics as well. We have ruler and chronometer, thermometer, etc. We measure things. How do we know that this is a precise and exact information in classical physics, but that's not uh, valid in quantum theory? Well, in classical physics, the measurements are ideal measurements and it's based on the fact that you can minimize the interaction as much as possible because of the very nature of classical physics. And it, as it is deterministic, you can, if we, on top of it, you can also infer the kind of limit as a result of that minimizing the interaction, so you get exact information. You get the exact information theoretically. In quantum theory, there is one obstacle, apart from the statistical nature of it, which is gathered in the span of 26 years from 1926. Apart from that statisticity, there is the quantization of the fundamental, uh, some of the fundamental constants, like the particles come in the multiples of electronic, the, the charge of the, all the entities in the micro world come in the multiples of electronic charge. That's the quantization of the charge. Almost all the charges are multiples of the so-called electronic charge. You know the strength of it, 10 to the minus 27, right? Coulomb. Electron carries that charge and proton carries the opposite of that charge and, uh, well, all the other particles come in. Two units of this charge, three units of that charge, etc. And there are no fractions of it. I say, and you say, no, uh, you, you, you should yell objecting it. You say quarks carry fractional charges, right? I talk about free particles. Entities existing as free particles in nature come in units, multiple, integer multiples of this, quant this unit of charge. That's an important phenomenon. It means that you are measuring something, you're intervening with the system. And then, of course, as in classical physics, let's take one of my favorite measurements, thermometer. I take a thermometer and then dip it into the uh, hot water. You, you are trying to measure the temperature of the glass of water. How that uh, system works? There is a heat flow, right, which is energy flow between the system. The warmer system is the glass of water, T, and there is energy flow from that body of the water to the thermometer so that the mercury rises because it gets some energy and it extends because of the extra energy and it rises in this scale. Question, as I measure say 98 degree in the thermometer because of the heat flow from the water to here, 
Then what happened to the water? It changed, right? It's not the same as before. It lost some energy. So whenever you measure something, you're intervening or interfering and you're changing the state, even at the classical level. But in classical physics, that doesn't harm her, that doesn't bother people because you can make a modification based on all these, in the, the, the nature of the classical physics, you can make corrections to it. You measured, say, 98.2, but because of this inflow and some loss in the temperature of the measured system, you can say it is the plus minus 0.2 degrees because of, to compensate that flow. Or you can uh, uh, reduce the interaction. You are free to reduce the interaction. There's no quantization like this in classical physics. So measurement is an exact phenomenon in the classical level, not in the quantum level. Because when you are measuring a microsystem, a micro microsystem is 10 to the minus 15 meters or smaller, right? 10 to the minus 15 meters or smaller. That's the scale. What are the time scales? Time scales are even uh, there also as, as short. So you have to use different sticks, different chronometers, different gadgets. You cannot look inside the atom and see it. Because you are made of the atoms. You are, your um, physiology is made of the atoms. You cannot, it would be a bootstrapping mechanism. You have to have different gadgets to measure. For example, how do you measure an electron's momentum? There's a beautiful Gedanken experiment of the Heisenberg thought, thought experiment in English. Well, that's a thought experiment, but people have developed such beautiful gadgetry lately so that they can really measure it. They can realize that those gadgets. For instance, one way of, here is supposedly in a, there is an electron, and you would like to measure this uh, momentum, you send some light on it, and it uh, recoils, and it scatters, and goes through, and you look at this. That's a thought experiment, but very educative, and you can go through the details of it using some of the optics arguments and the principle of microscope. What happens is that, you scatter this light, here is, there is a, a, you know, a gun of light and you send the light on here, the electron, and it's recoiled and the light scatters from it, goes through the microscope, goes through and then you see it. And you can, this is a scattering experiment involving photon, and you can, you can use the basic principle of conservation of momentum and energy and analyze it. And you can really measure that P prime, which reaches to your eye. Is this, does it change the system? Of course it changes, because when it scatters, the electron recoils, and then it's not in the same position as before. Is this system, the state of the system has changed? the state of the system has changed. If it is this pair of coordinates of momenta, this pair is not the same as before of the measurement, because you intervened with this. You see the reason why quantum, in quantum mechanics measurement is so crucial and important. When you measure something, you change it. Then it really opens a new avenue. If this is a starting point of for um, coming up with the, uh, setting the foundations of quantum theory, obviously you have to start questioning the concept, classical concept of state first. And classical concept of state contains positions and momenta. But I know that if, for example, if I measure the position, momenta changes. If I ch measure the momenta, position change. And that depends on the order. If it depends on the order, then life will be quite different in the, the foundation, the formulation should be quite different. Because what I'm doing is the following. Suppose here I carry out a measurement of Q measurement, for instance. Suppose I have a pair of Q and P mimicking the X and P there and found a value like Q1, 
and system evolved and then I can think of making a measurement. I can repeat the same measurement. Q. I, I will illustrate this on the Stengarma experiment, experimental gadgetry in a moment. If I repeat the measurement of Q and Q and Q, I have to do it immediately after, of course, without when this, before the system disintegrates or decays, then I will always find the Q1. But suppose after that I carried out a measurement, after the same has evolved, I carried out measurement of P, found P1, for instance. Question, what are the values of the Q and P? Can I say it is the Q1 and P1 which I obtain from these? This is consecutive to two consecutive measurements. As I found Q1 first and then P1 next, and I may say, okay, that's it, boys. I finished the measurement that the values of these QP pairs are Q1 and P1. Is it? There's one way to find out. You carry out another measurement of, well, if you repeat on this system measuring P's, you'll always find P1, 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 because the system is not disintegrated yet. But suppose it evolved and you carry out the measure, another Q measurement. Which one is the correct value of Q? Is it the one before, the one I found before, Q1, or this Q2? Or can I say Q1, P1 is the correct values, or P1, Q2 are the correct values? I don't know. Notice that, as I will illustrate in the Stengerla uh, system, when you carry out a measurement in here on the, on, the observe, on the entity Q, whatever previous information you had before, because you may be coming through, it's lost, and the state is such that whenever you repeat the measurement, you always find Q1, and so that new state is something associated with that Q observable. Eventually, we will, know, we will say that it's going to be an eigenstate. It's going to collapse into the eigenstate of that Q entity. What that entity, what is that entity? Is it a number? We don't know yet, we'll decide. Or when I proceed, of course that state is well defined. It is sort of, I am borrowing from the feature. It's an eigenstate of the Q associated with this eigenvalue. Now I carry out another measurement on the other P entity. And what is the uh, new state? Does it have anything to do with the previous information that the state has orbited? No. Again, that's lost. And uh, this new intervention or interference to measure that P, to reach to P1 out of many infinitely possible values, perhaps, if it is an infinite dimensional Hilbert space, or uh, possible values of one of the two in the, for the two state systems P1 has, again lost. So we cannot really decide whether it is this pair or that pair, you repeat it again. And so measuring a system creates a new state. And the previous information about the previous state is lost. New state is associated with the particular measurement. Because if you are, if you are measuring a particular dynamical quantity, out of the sudden, that's the Copenhagen interpretation, the eigenvalues of that object enters, eigenstates and eigenvalues enter in the stem, into the system, and the system collapses in the particular eigenstate in which that particular result appears. So then, obviously, you measure Q first and then P next, you get something, or you measure P first and Q next, you get another thing, Obviously, the lesson we extract based on that basic discussion, measurement is crucial and measurement is order dependent. So this is the lesson that I extract. Measurement is order dependent. Measurement of entities, 
what were the entities in the classical physics? Dynamical variables, position, momentum, angular momentum, energy, whatever, all those things. It was something which we didn't meet in the classical realm. Measurement is a order-dependent order thing. Measurement in micro-world, atomic world, that is. I was using the entities which enter into the classical definition of the state and I e, e, focused on the basic operation which is at the center of all the physics, the measurement. I tried to order the, I tried to measure them in one order and in the other order I realized that the result I get for the two will be different so none of them is the correct values for that pair. So I, I wasn't able to measure them precisely and correctly simultaneously or immediately after. That's, it. That's something very interesting. That first of all puts this in doubt. So something indirectly, that definition of state is in doubt. Second, measurement is an order dependent thing. So nature of those entities, not only that this represents a state that's gone, then these themselves are not just numbers anymore. Because if they were numbers, if I could have measured them in, in consecutively, and the process wouldn't be order dependent. We need new mathematical entities. What are those new mathematical entities? which may depend on the order of operations. Well, mathematicians discovered such things long before the advent of quantum theory. They are the, the simplistically matrices or more profoundly operators, linear operators. And they are uh, di fundamentally different than the C numbers, ordinary numbers. They depend on the order. If you multiply them in one order, you get one result. If you multiply them in another order, you get another result. Aha, we say. Perhaps these are the things that you have been looking for in the region of quantum theory. To represent these dynamical variables, we need order-dependent mathematical entry entities. dynamical, classical dynamical variables. We had to go from this classical concept to this. What are they? Operators or matrices, right? Matrices is a representation of operator, but let me be not that sophisticated now. There are such things in mathematics. So we have to introduce operators and represent the dynamical variables as operators because they are order dependent. If I multiply an operator A with B in the AB order, I get some C operator. If I multiply B operator with A in the BA order, I get C prime. And in, except in very, very, very special cases that they are commuting, C and C prime is different. In, in agreement, in compliance with that observation of measurements. So we had to go back to this. And in the con now I'm going back and forth. The classical concept of state measurement and the operators and questioning the state again. I started with the state, introduced the operators, non-commuting entities, and then I re-questioned the state. Full set of X's and P's. 
which are to be measured simultaneously because we need gathering of information, that's experimentation, which is the measurement. Once I have that state, then I can predict all the future states precisely and deterministically. But it's not obvious that I can measure them simultaneously and precisely. I cannot gather this information anymore. If I cannot gather that information, I cannot use that pair as the definition of a state. So what is the state? Well, you may say, use the half of it. All Qs, obviously, you can measure the Qs simultaneously. All the Ps, perhaps. Well, that wouldn't function because uh, this quantization of charge, which is an uh, uh, essential feature of the micro-world entities, like the electric charge or other charges, and there is also statisticity. In uh, the micro-world, things are statistical. They show, show statistical behavior. What is the most profound experiment, most profound observation which shows the statisticity of the nature? Well, I have to refer to great scientist Feynman at this level. He says, at some point, if you, if you have read his books, at all age, at all the time, you have to read that, those books, really. He says, double slit experiment is the essence of quantum mechanics. If you understand the double slit experiment, you understand quantum theory. What is double slit experiment? You send a beam of projectiles. Of course, these are micro projectiles. Their sizes should be 10 to the minus 15 meters, like electrons or protons or whatever. Then you look at the pattern beyond the double slit you see that it deviates fundamentally and drastically from a classical pattern of continuous distribution. There are fringes, which is a typical behavior of waves. So there's wave-particle duality and the statistical nature. So when you go into short distances at the micro-world, there's also that feature, that property. Wave, part, at the, in, in the regimes, an object may behave like a particle in the Compton scattering, for instance. And in other cases, in double slit experiment, they behave like waves. So these two property, which is classically totally isolated and uh, orthogonal concepts to each other, now you may, an entity may carry both of these attributes simultaneously depending on the regime energy in all those regimes. One, may, one property may manifest itself or the other property. One, it's a multi-faced multi entities, either particle or, an, or wave. Because of this wave nature associated with all those classical things that we have known before as particles, then obviously there must be a wave-like entity which should be the, used to describe the state in the micro world. Okay, that new description is the so-called state vector in a linear vector space, whose coordinates are the wave functions. The coordinates in a given basis, like x or p, but not both. Now, after all this really semi-philosophical discussion, perhaps I should start illustrating this on the famous Stengerla experiment. And according to another scientist, not as great as Feynman himself, but he's a good history of science fellow, Jerry Bernstein. The other day I was reading one of his historical history of science papers. He said, I will try to show that Feynman was wrong, saying that double solid experiment is the quantum mechanics. You, you, that is, if you understand double slit experiment, you understand quantum mechanics, the essence of quantum mechanics. He says it's not the double slit experiment, it's the Stengerla experiment. So these are, of course, not physical arguments, these are philosophical arguments, and there are some niceties involved with that. So this gentleman was trying to attract our attention on the Stengerla experiment for the obvious reason. Stengerla experiment involves spin. And I will describe what type of spin-carrying 
objects used in that experiment. But I already mentioned in the previous hour that spin is a very intrinsically and exclusively quantum mechanical entity, concept. There is no counterpart in classical physics. So you cannot really imagine or mimic as a spinning top that's wrong. It is the quantum, it is the angular momentum an object still carries, keep carrying when it's set into, when it's put at rest. Because when it's moving, it's going, there is going to be orbital angular momentum. But when it's put at rest, if it still manifests an angular momentum-like behavior, it must be purely quantum mechanical. That's, for that reason, I guess that gentleman should be referring to that Stengerle experiment as the central experiment in the quantum mechanics. That is, to appreciate the important significance of quantum concepts, you have to study the Stengerle experiment carefully. Let me start describing the, let me make a small introduction to the Stengerle before the break for five minutes, and then we will discuss that in the context of all those abstract concepts that I have mentioned. You'll see that these are abstract concepts could be illustrated very easily for the Stenger, in the context of Stengerle experiment because it is an object, spin one half carrying object, sent through a magnetic field and then looking at the splitting of the beams, then you deduce whatever you are supposed to be deducing, that you cannot measure two different components of certain quantity simultaneously. P and Q is the usual pair, momentum and position. And that's also the pair used in the einstein podolsky rosen paper to illustrate the incompleteness of quantum theory. But there was this other gentleman, David Bohm, which was a student of great scientist Oppenheimer at Berkeley. I have to, of course, quote Berkeley. I am a product of University of California at Berkeley, therefore. These are former professors of mine there. So it, it is, it, he's using not the position and momentum, he's using the spin one half. They have two states. The Hilbert, it's not a Hilbert space, it's a finite two-dimensional linear vector space. Handling it easy, the any measurement yields two, pro, two results. Not infinite set of values out of which you have to choose one you get either one result or the other, and that's defined by the direction of the magnetic field. Spin is either aligned up or down. It's nice. If it is one out of the two, it is easy to handle that, that problem, of course. So therefore, let me uh, plot the picture and make a, a simple introduction to the Stengerla, and then le let's illustrate that profound principle of ordering in the measurements. None Okay. And also, the, the outcome of this non commuting property of certain quantities reflecting in the measurement. So here comes the Sangala. Let me check the date. Sometimes uh, it's difficult to remember those dates. As early as 1921-22. So it's, it's a two-year span of historically sometimes it's important to pay attention to the dates. You know why? Because remember the quantum theory was started essentially triggered in 1900 by Planck's, Planck's explanation of the black body radiation eliminating the paradoxes involved with the ener infinite energy with the high frequencies. In 1905 by Einstein, the photon concept. And there's a big, long history through 1926. I write all these great guys, the founding fathers of quantum theory, that is Schrodinger, Heisenberg, Dirac, 
And perhaps, to be fair, we have to include Born, because that's the father of the Copenhagen. Not the, bo not the Born, but Born, Max Born, the Born rule. That psi mod squared is the probability density. It's an important thing. Nowadays, people are trying to drive this rule instead of taking it as a, uh, as a postulate. But anyway, some people say that that's not as great as the other three, but these are the founding fathers. And notice that there is a long history, but this important experiment for certain people like Jerry Bernstein, probably the most important, historically the most important experiment, it takes place in here. Before actually the quantum synthesis of quantum mechanics was completed. Huh? So that makes it an important experiment. These guys are great guys. Well, actually, if you do a bit of historic science reading, Stern, who was, uh, I guess, somewhere in, uh, perhaps, B Munich, went to Prague to see Einstein, who was temporarily there along the way before ending up in, uh, at uh, ETH, talked to him, etc. You know, these great gentlemen, they were talking to each other. Actually, we didn't have a full, complete theory of quantum theory. They, these gentlemen came up with that experiment is important. Okay, we give a, again, break, and I start discussing this Tangela. It's going to be, so we have to pay due tribute to these gentlemen, apparently historical, really historically important experiments that we are talking about. <laughs>